This conference will now. So today I'm going to take you through um, the Kimberley, um, which I'm sure most of you have have heard of. Um, it is a beautiful part of Australia, um, and one that is on most Aussies' bucket list. And uh, and this is probably why I want to talk about it with you today is because it's one of those places that Australians tend to think of. One day I'll go there, um, but not until I've seen the rest of the world. And so now that we're in, in lockdown, um, this is the perfect opportunity for your clients to go and discover the Kimberley and a chance for you to really help piece together a beautiful itinerary for them. Now it's said that um, there are few marine and coastal environments left on earth that are as bio biologically diverse, physically remote or stunningly beautiful as the Kimberley. I personally like to think of it as um, a bit like discovering Antarctica. So um, it's just that wilderness area with very few people there, um, except it's, um, it's not covered in ice, it's uh, nice and sunny. So the Kimberley, it's up in this top region here, um, mostly in Western Australia, but does, uh, does touch into the Northern Territory. And that is one thing to bear in mind um, with itineraries is there's a time zone difference um, that can really throw people. I think it's about an hour and a, or an hour and a half difference. So that's just something to keep in mind. So the region of the Kimberley is larger than Germany. Um, which normally has about 83 million people in it. Um, and I think Kimberley's got something like 40, 40 to 50,000 people in it. So it's very, very isolated and sparsely populated. Today I'm going to try and cover as much as I can, but as you can imagine, something the size of Germany um, is quite hard to cover in sort of less than an hour. One thing to note about the Kimberley is that it's um, national heritage listed, most of it's national heritage listed. You've um, basically got this whole, the Kimberley sort of roughly this blue region here and where the sort of red stripes are here is basically what's national heritage listed. You've got about 2,000 kilometres of coastline off along here and there's about 2,500 islands that are pretty much uninhabited. Maybe there's a few um, Aboriginals living on some of the islands. Um, but really there's just not much, not much there, not much population. And then down here you've got um, the uh, Bungle Bungles, which is a UNESCO World Heritage Site. So in terms of um, time frames for the Kimberleys, I typically say allow six to 14 nights because there is a lot to do and see. I mean, you could, you know, you could spend a month or two there really if you wanted to. Um, getting in and out, so really, the, um, the entry and the exit points are Broome and Kununurra. Um, so when flights are normally operating in peak season, um, during the dry season, you will get scheduled flights um, generally from Perth, Darwin um, and Sydney and Melbourne to, to these areas. Um, Kununurra, they did open up directly from Melbourne, I think it was last year or the year before. Um, I, you know, it's a bit hard to tell what's going to open up um, in the coming months, but um, yeah, certainly it's serviced enough, easily enough. So I mentioned before that um, it's very sparsely populated. So roughly that whole area of um, the size of Germany is uh, only has about 40 to 50,000 people um, swelling in the, in, the, uh, in the dry season. And you've got about 44% of the population, the local population being Aboriginal. So English could actually be their second, third or fourth language, which I think really makes this an interesting um, place to visit. Um, it, because it is so vast populated, you know, you do get airports a bit like this um, This one, the Mitchell Plateau Airport. So um, it really is very, very basic, um, not staffed. I personally have been um, stuck at an airport like this um, in, um, when our plane hit a bird on takeoff. So um, you've got to be, <laughs> be prepared, maybe have some extra water and a, um, a snack bar with you. Um, this is this is the broom. So even brooms only got about fifteen thousand people in it. And then you've got your typical smaller communities that you would go through um, if you're sort of if you're travelling overland and you know and there's sort of a one one shop town. 
So in terms of the climate, um, as you would know, this top half of Australia is monsoonal. So um, really the best time to go is between sort of, I'd say late October and, sorry, late April and October. Um, during that time, absolutely beautiful weather, generally um, no rain whatsoever, gorgeous um, warm days and reasonably cool nights. Um, and then when the when the rains come, so what happens is you've got the uh, the build up, which it sort of starts around November and December, and that's when it starts getting really, really, really humid, and people are just waiting and waiting and waiting for the clouds to break and the rains to come, and the, that humidity starts to drop. Um, but what happens up in this region is you do get roads that get cut off um, and towns that get cut off, so it's not an ideal time to travel around. Um, certainly even as late as April, if there's still waters, um, you might not be able to get to some of the tourist um, tourist places. So it's just something to keep in mind. And every year is different because every year the, the rains are different. So one year will be different to another. Um, but with, uh, with all those rains, gives you what is some of the most spectacular scenery in Australia. Um, so you get things like these incredible waterfalls, um, this is King George uh, coming out um, coming out into the ocean and Mitchell Falls here. These, these are two of the um, waterfalls that you'd visit on a, on a Kimberley cruise or you could visit the Mitchell Falls um, from inland with a, with a helicopter flight. And again, some more of the beautiful, um, interesting scenery that you get because of the wet season that, we, that occurs up there. Um, certainly seeing it by the air is absolutely spectacular. So travelling in the Kimberley, you, you do have these large um, distances between all the highlights um, and that's one of the things that makes it a bit of a challenge for people. And along the coast, as I said earlier, you've got about um, two and a half thousand of these little islands along this basically barren coast. It's like it's like going to Antarctica. There, you know, there really isn't anything there. So you get to explore it, but you really do need um, to, to be with someone who knows what they're doing. Um, so in terms of a budget way to do the Kimberley, and believe me, I've tried for myself because I would love to um, love to go back again. Um, it's really only doing that self-drive, you know, the grey nomad style or, you know, backpacker style um, camping or perhaps on one of the um, more larger sort of group camping trips where you need to sort of get up early and you've got quite long distances to cover. Um, but we generally recommend for our international clients, either for them to do an air safari, so really travelling um, either by helicopter or, or small plane, if, if possible, if you can afford it. I mean, and there are enough um, chartered flights to get around in certain places. Otherwise, going on a four-wheel drive camping safari with a guide who really knows where to take you and takes you away from where all the tourists are. And then you've, you've also got the... Um, the Kimberley coastline. So really doing that um, on a small ship, um, luxury crew. It's, it is very hard to do the Kimberley cheaply. I, um, I really have um, looked for certain ways and I, there's, there are little ways around it where you can certainly save a bit of money, but um, it's certainly not, it is quite hard to do it on a budget. Um, so why go? Um, it really is Australia's uh, last frontier. Um, so you've got these incredible landscapes, you've got really interesting bird and wildlife and you've got obviously just with that remoteness comes um, really quirky um, colourful people you know and things like you might have one policeman for like he's got a 1000 kilometre radius so it might take him a day to get from one place to another so all of that kind of brings, bring, brings in the interesting and quirky Australian characters. And another reason really is um, the Aboriginal culture. And I can't sort of highlight this strongly enough that really it's something that we need to um, understand and look into more. There's research at the moment looking at the rock art in the Kimberley region um, and some of the, the tools and the, um, the, the uh, bits and pieces that the researchers are finding. And it's really changing the way that, um, that we as a human population think about our history because it's predating anything from ever before. You've also got these um, 
it, this island just off the Kimberley coast um, called the High Cliffy Islands, um, where they've actually got um, footage of these Aboriginals who apparently were about seven feet tall. They were very, very big and strong, just living off the seafood. On this island, they had these kind of circular rock structures, um, and somehow they just disappeared one day, and it's all still a bit of a mystery. But really, going and digging into that Aboriginal culture um, is something that I would recommend for um, for any of your clients that are going on a Kimberley trip. Trip, and obviously, we can also take them to lots of different rock art sites as well. Um, one of the one of my favourite parts of the Kimberley, I mentioned. Um, Sort of seen it by um, from from up above, is uh, you've got the largest tidal flows in the southern hemisphere. So you're going sort of um, twice a day from sort of roughly 10 10 to 12 meters between high and low, and so what that what that sort of causes is all these really interesting kind of ocean phenomena phenomena. So um, on the right here you've got Montgomery Reef, which um, at high tide it, um, I think it stretches over about 20 square kilometres and at low tide it, it really comes out uh, out of the sea and takes up something like 300 square kilometres um, and it can you know catch people off guard. Um, you can go out there and do um, do tours and what happens is you sort of you sit there uh, while it's still high tide and you just wait and then all of a sudden this reef appears out of nowhere and you've got a waterfall coming off the reef. Um, you've got horizontal falls, which I'm sure you would have already heard of, um, where the tidal flows go between two channels and really cause that interesting phenomena as well. So this is it from above. So these are the sort of all the little 2,000, 2,500 islands I mentioned, the Buccaneer Archipelago. And this, with the combination of the tides, is what's causing all these really cool um, phenomena. So you've got, uh, this is a flight I did over horizontal falls that you can you can see there. Um, definitely seeing this region by air is an absolute highlight. I, I personally ran out of um, <laughs> out of camera battery. I just could not stop taking photos because it was just absolutely beautiful. Um, very mesmerizing. And on the sea you can you can experience this um, these tidal phenomena um, when you go out by boat. Um, there's a place called Signet Bay Pearl Farm out of uh, Perth, uh, sorry, out of Broome. It's about two and a half hours north of Broome. Um, and you go out, they, this is, um, they need to have these amphibious vessels. So you can see it's got a, got a boat on it, uh, sorry, got, a, um, got some wheels on it, on the boat. Um, and that's again because you need to drive over the beach to get out to the sea because of these tidal differences. You know, it could be, it could be two kilometres, the, the difference. Um, between the uh, where the coast is at high tide and low tide, so you go on these amphibious vessels, and um, in between the the islands, the it forms these kind of giant whirlpools. This picture just absolutely doesn't do it justice whatsoever. They are literally sort of going past these really strong tides, with a whirlpool about the size of houses. Um, it really is one of the the best things I've ever experienced. I took a couple of um, agents from overseas on this particular trip and we all just came away from it just going wow that's one of the coolest things we've done um, and then you then you hop into um, places between where all these tides are going and you've got this absolutely beautiful flat like a lake um, pristine uh, waters where it's crystal clear and just absolutely beautiful and relaxing and then you've got little um, islands like this this sandbar here that just pop up when it's low tide you know, a perfect place that we could um, come down as for drink, with drinks um, and, and the sunset for your clients. You could do a special event there, perhaps you go for lunch. Um, so some really nice experiences that you can uh, that you can uh, do around with all the um, funny tides there. So I'm just, um, I'm going to start in terms of uh, the, the way I uh, lead this presentation. Just I'm going to start in Broome and kind of end in Kananara and then with some um, accommodations. Um, it's, it's a bit hard because there is so much in the Kimberley for, um, for your guests, but um, generally you're going to probably probably start in Broome or end in Broome. Um, and really you would know that it's famous for its sunsets on Cable Beach. Um, you've got the camels there. I personally 
we would not normally sell a, a camel chip. Um, it, it, it's fantastic to look at, but you know, it's not the sort of thing we typically would put our clients on with, you know, so many people. Um, if if we're taking your clients there, we would take them to um, a place kind of to watch the sunset, but away from the crowds because it can get very busy down on, on Cable Beach there. Broome's got a really, really interesting multicultural history, um, very much with the, the Japanese. It's all to do with the, the pearl diving. Um, so the Japanese and the Aboriginals. And um, I think really, if, if your clients are going to Broome, it is worth doing some kind of history day tour there to learn about all of that. Um, and there's a few historic spots that they can, um, they can go and visit as well. Broome can get quite busy in peak season. So it does push up the prices. Um, so the accommodation there, for example, um, Cable Beach Club is probably their most well-known um, sort of high-end accommodation. Even that at peak season, um, the prices can go a lot more than what you would pay for the equivalent kind of hotel in Sydney. So it's just something to be aware of as well. Um, so in and around Broome, I'm just gonna show you a few sort of activities. Um, you know, we, there's obviously the Aboriginal element that I mentioned, I might, must have touched on this last time, but, um, you know, taking your clients out with that real sort of ocean to plate experience, going mud crabbing or spear fishing and then cooking something up on the beach for them. Um, this is a, his, they call him the uh, Gandalf uh, uh, astronomer. Um, he's got a little TV show. Um, but he can take, he rides a motorbike, he can take your clients out and, you know, you're up in the middle of nowhere, you've got the most amazing sky and it's really worth uh, going up and having a look at, uh, at the stars and learning from him. He's, he's just self-taught. Um, and then um, pearling experiences. I mentioned earlier that Broome really uh, was built around the pearling um, industry. And so there's a few different family owned pearl farms there. Signet Bay, I mentioned with its sea safaris earlier. You've also got Pass Bailey, which is probably the most well known luxury pearl brand um, in the world. Um, and there's all sorts of different experiences we can arrange for your clients, whether it's, you know, going out and seeing a working pearl farm or perhaps visiting um, their private collections, um, watching a pearl get unshucked. Um, that it's Learning about pearls is actually um, much more interesting and, and, and even very interesting for men, um, even though you think it's a sort of a more female thing. Um, Broome gets the, the humpback whales coming past. Um, so there's about 40,000 that come up every year um, and then are hovering around Broome. So likely that you'll, um, your clients will be able to see them in, in peak season because that's about when they come. Um, I remember when I was at Broome, we were about to start going on a tour and our, our guide said, oh, what's that in the water? And, and it wasn't actually, um, it wasn't a whale, but it was a couple of manta rays that had come and were just hanging off the beach at Cable Beach there. I touched last time on the uh, the dinosaur prints um, and I thought I'd just show you a, a, a little picture of um, an experience I went and did to go and look at the dinosaur prints. So we, um, we went out, just pre-dawn and it depends on the time of the tides. So we did breakfast with the dinosaurs. We went out with this um, Aboriginal guide. His name is Bart Pigram. He's um, he's one of the Discover Aboriginal Experiences guides. And um, if you're not aware of that um, co-op of, of experiences, I would, I would recommend having a look at that for your clients. So Discover Aboriginal Experiences. They're all vetted Aboriginal experiences um, around Australia with good Aboriginal guides. Um, so Bart's fantastic and he went and this is not actually the dinosaur print here. This is this is a little dinosaur print here. Um, but a low tide these um, these prints are exposed. So he goes and tells you the Aboriginal version of their stories and all the landmarks around uh, around Broome, and um, it's yeah, it's really nice. And then some delicious um, breakfast afterwards. Um, horizontal falls, which I touched on before. So there's a few ways um, that you can see horizontal falls. They, it is um, a fair bit north of Broome, so. Um, you, don't, you, you wouldn't drive there, you typically either go on a cruise to see it or you can do a flyover or you can do a fly on a seaplane and land down there and stay overnight on a little luxury houseboat. 
um, and then you can jump on a um, like a speedboat thing and you can zip through the falls and have a bit of an experience. So this is an option perhaps for your clients who might not have the budget to perhaps do an entire Kimberley cruise but would like to have that experience of staying on the water out in the middle of the of the Kimberley. And up north, also in that region, this is called the Dampier Peninsula, you've got um, an Aboriginal camp called Kuljaman. So that's Aboriginal owned and run. Um, it's, um, it's, not, it's not luxury, um, but you're basically on, on the tip of the, uh, the Dampier Peninsula, you've got these incredible red rocks. You probably have seen these kind of red rocks in, um, you know, in tourism ads. Um, and it's very much sort of on that, um, you know that that camping circuit that goes around the Kimberley area. So it can be full of um, full of campers. There's a um, sort of an on-site restaurant there, but because it's Aboriginal owned and run, you've got to bring your own alcohol. Um, and they've got these kind of glamping options with actually beautiful scenery. Um, so they're perfectly comfortable, but they're they're certainly not luxury. And it's a um, you know it's a, a um, self catering experience. But there's a swimming beach there and it's a great, great place to spot, stop for a couple of days. You've got a few experiences from there. So um, I did this um, Aboriginal experience with um, Bundy. This is Bundy here. So he's one of their Aboriginal elders. Um, he's very, he's very softly spoken, but I mean, it's one of the most authentic experiences that I've had. And he just took us around the area and showed us the bush food. He, um, he was, it was quite mystical. So he sort of said to us at one stage, he said, you know, are you feeling a bit hot? And we're like, yeah, feeling a bit hot here because obviously it's up in the Kimberley. So do you want me to call the wind? And we're like, okay. And he did this kind of mystical thing and, and the wind appeared. I don't know whether it would have appeared anyway, but it was, it was quite a special, um, special experience. Also in the same region and probably half an hour um, away from Kuljaman is where Signet Bay, um, Signet Bay Pearl Farm is, where those sea safaris are. So they, um, they, they only, it, was a, it is a working pearl farm and they only opened up to tourism 10 years ago. Um, and again, with that kind of camp, camping person in mind, they have created some um, sort of glamping tents to stay in. And then you've also got um, the, form, the owner's former home um, they're called the Master Pearlers Retreat, which I'll talk about in just a second. Um, the, the setting is absolutely beautiful and those um, tidal experiences, the sea safaris are just ridiculously fun. Um, they've also got pearling experiences. So um, we could organise for your clients to do some really high end um, sort of private experiences, but there are also some, um, some uh, shared experiences that your clients could do as well. Um, their guide there, um, I've forgotten his name, I feel terrible. Um, he, he grew up with the owner, um, a man named James Brown, sort of as, as school friend. So he's very involved with the, um, with the pearling community there and he can take your clients on some um, Aboriginal bush, fo bush foods walks as well. Um, when he opened up a, a pearl for us, um, which a pearl shell, he just, he, it just popped out. Um, he then ate the pearl meat um, the gooey bit, <laughs> which I wouldn't normally do, but obviously um, for him it's kind of just just normal. Um, the Master Pearls Retreat. So this is on the Signet Bay Pearl Farm property, but it's actually about a 20 minute drive away from the main area. Um, so it's very, very private. Um, it's, it's kind of in two, uh, uh, not two houses, um, Two, two sort of rooms separated, two buildings separated by a bit of a walkway. You've got this um, big lounge kitchen area with the most beautiful view to watch the sunset. And then you've sort of got the, um, the bedroom section. You've got two um, bedrooms upstairs and then you've got a sort of a funny configuration of two bedrooms underneath. Um, it doesn't have en suites. It's got, it's got two and a half bathrooms, but they're not actually technically en suites. So you need to kind of walk down the, uh, the hall to access them, which could be a problem for some of your really high end clients. But I think if you set the expectation for them, um, it would be absolutely fine. 
I think this would be a really nice opportunity for, um, for families or a couple of groups of friends um, with the parents staying upstairs and perhaps the kids staying, staying downstairs. Um, when I went there, we had, um, they brought in the local chef and he cooked us a, up a three course meal. We did try some of the, um, the actual pearl meat, not the, not the gooey bit, which was delicious. We had that as a um, ceviche. Um, and then we ate breakfast the next day um, down in the main kind of reception area, which is this kind of area here. But I think um, this is quite an affordable option to have a Kimberley experience um, quite privately compared to some of the other um, Kimberley experiences. And then out of room, um, I can't remember if I touched on this last time, you have um, Rolly Shoals, which is one of, um, one of the top diving destinations in, in the world. Um, it's these three coral atolls. Um, best time of year is probably sort of September, September, October. Um, and essentially, it, you need to get there and stay on a liverboard. Um, only about three or 400 people go there a year. So it's very, very uncrowded, very, very pristine. Um, lots and lots of big fish. Um, is, it is suitable for snorkelers as well as divers and then they have other sort of activities for people who aren't full full blown divers. Um, but you you take a boat from Broome um, at about five or six PM at night time and then by the time you wake up in the morning you have arrived out at Rolly Shoals. Um, so a good option for your clients who, you know, they've they've done the Great Barrier Reef and want something a little bit different. So then uh, that's kind of the broom area. So th the region I was talking about just now is sort of this um, Dampier Peninsula here. Um, you've got horizontal falls that are sort of somewhere around here. Um, so that was sort of all a sort of, you know, within a couple of days trip of out of broom. You've then got um, quite an iconic four wheel drive adventure called the Gibb River Road um, trip. So this is a red, the red dotted line here that sort of goes, sort of, well, you start off on a, on a um, sealed road, but then you go on this kind of four wheel drive track from Derby up to sort of Wyndham towards Kununurra. So in terms of driving around the Kimberley, you either have this road or you have the sealed road, which is this black one, but um, you're not gonna sort of get the, you know, the down and dirty off um, off the beaten track kind of experiences there. So it's a 660 kilometer trip, um, not really doable during the wet season. Um, so it can really become impassable. And, you know, depending, as I said, on how, uh, how strong the wet season was, you know, it, that's when it will depend on when the road will actually open up. Um, so there's a whole bunch of iconic kind of um, gorges and swim holes, um, geological rock formations, lots of um, wildlife. So these, are, that's sort of the reason that you would do this. And you'd probably take, you know, a week or so to do it. Um, you can do it as self-drive in your own four-wheel drive if you're, if you're um, pretty confident. Um, we would suggest to do it with a guide so that they can take you and show you the places um, that are a bit more special. Along the way, you see things like this. So, um, and this is some of the beauty of the, um, the inland of the Kimberley. So you've got these boabs that um, came uh, from Africa, I think from Madagascar, probably they think about 70,000 years ago. So in Africa, they're called boabab, here they're called boabs. Um, they are now considered, um, you know, an Australian plant because they've been here that long. Um, you've got some, you know, a lot of the scenery there. You'll find some absolutely beautiful, beautiful, massive boabs. Um, very, very photogenic and one of my um, my little favourite things in, in the Kimberley region. And then you've got this beautiful escarpment area. So really heading into, into the Kimberley, this is the kind of terrain you'll see. And then you've got these beautiful stunning gorges. So with quite high cliffs, um, and then depending on what sort of where you are in the season, how you know what the water holes look like, whether they're filled with water or whether they've dried up. You've got some really unique wildlife in this region as well. Um, and so uh, what's happened since um, 
well, since the European settlers came along um, and introduced, you know, the cattle, the pigs, um, you know, cats, which have now turned feral, um, a lot of that wildlife is disappearing. Um, and especially a lot of these smaller mammals are really, um, you know, Australia's got one of the biggest extinction rates of mammals in the world. So going up into the Kimberley region, you'll still have an opportunity to see um, some of this unique wildlife in the wild as it was um, pre-European um, pre settler time before it disappears, because there's no doubt that, um, you know, our farming practices, our feral animals, are having a huge impact on on the wildlife. So it is a um, you know if if you're into wildlife and conservation, I would um, head up to the Kimberley, and I would in particular go to um, this place here. It's the Mornington Wilderness Sanctuary. So um, it's part of the Australian Wildlife Conservancy. I'm not sure if you've heard of the Australian Wildlife Conservancy. They are the biggest private land owner in Australia, if not the world, from a conservation perspective. They own all these parcels of land around Australia and in them they have scientists that are, you know, doing research on the wildlife population, on the impact of the feral animals, on the impact of fire practices um, and they're obviously trying to protect them. So um, depending on your clients, we can you know, either just organise a stay and they could go on some of the um, shared touring experiences or if they've got a massive bunch of money and want to do something philanthropic, we, you know, if they want to donate something like $50,000, we can get them a very special experience somewhere. Um, it, 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 then the thing you need to keep in mind is they are, they are a conservancy more than a tourism business, if that makes sense. So their key goal is um, con um, conserving the land. They also have um, a nearby property, it's about two properties along, um, that covers an area called the Artesian Range. Now the Artesian Range is very, very inaccessible just because of the way the land um, is formed. It's got these high gorges, um, it's got this rainforest, it hasn't um, been degraded by um, fire as much as other parts of the Kimberley and um, the animals there haven't been affected by the feral predators. So um, it really is like going to, back in time and seeing Australia as it was um, before white man came along. Um, it is how the Kimberley and a lot of Australia used to be before we kind of destroyed it. So there's no accommodation in there. You'd have to, we'd have to helicopter your clients in potentially bringing in some um, some kayaks and doing a really adventurous style um, trip there with a scientist or a researcher, sleeping in swags, um, you know, a real, um, a real experience. Um, along sort of the Gibb River Road or sort of off it, um, I spoke last week about the, um, the bungle bungles that were only discovered in 1984 by white people. Um, so they're these um, beautiful rock formations. It's a World Heritage National um, Park. Um, there's lots of Aboriginal um, artwork there. You've got walks um, through the gorges through here. Um, you get these big cathedral-like domes. Um, and you could spend a couple of nights there. There is some accommodation down there, or you could do a day trip from Kununurra. So really it just depends on the sort of itinerary we build for your clients and, and what they would like to see. You can take sort of scenic helicopter flights above it. Um, you know, there's, there's as, as much or as little as um, your clients want to do there. And then Kununurra, so this is sort of the far end of the um, Gib, Gib River Road. Um, you know, and it, it um, probably doesn't have a great reputation um, as being a very attractive town, but I actually um, I actually thought it was way prettier than I um, was expecting. It's um, it's on this Ord River that's part of the whole um, Lake Argyle, the Ord River Dam kind of complex. So you've got actually beautiful um, wildlife and bird life that congregates around the river. Um, and I was only there for a night, but I probably would probably suggest spending um, two nights there and, and taking a, a, a cruise on the uh, on the river. Um, you can do the scenic flights to the Bungle Bungles in a day trip from here. It's too far to drive. It's um, I think it's something like five hours just to get to the start of the Bungle Bungles National Park. 
from here. So you wouldn't do that in a day. Um, in terms of luxury accommodation, not a lot. Um, there's perfectly comfortable, uh, you know, three star self catering kind of accommodation there. Um, there's some good art galleries. Um, and it's really a sort of jumping off point or your end point for those um, Kimberley cruises because it's about an hour to um, Wyndham, which is um, which is the port there. And it's also about an hour drive to El Cuestro, which I'll go into in just a minute. But I would say you can spend, you know, more than just one night um, if you needed to. So now I'm just going to run through some of um, sort of the more luxury accommodation options in the Kimberley. Um, and then I'm just going to finish on um, some of the cruises. So this is um, the Kimberley Coastal Camp. Um, and this is, you know, really as, as remote as it gets. It's very rustic, um, but it's, you know, people come away from it having had a really amazing experience. Um, so, so they only take 16 guests and you can only get there by either seaplane, helicopter or boat. So it's all about, um, it's all about the water. It's, it is very, uh, very fishing focused. Um, so you sort of all your, it's all inclusive and um, you go out and you can, you can do some fishing and then you can go and visit some rock art in, in the, in the back here. There's dingoes and animals um, and um, yeah, a really amazing experience. There's a couple of, um, couple of shots from it. So you've got um, very rustic style accommodation. They uh, they didn't until about a year ago. They didn't have en suites, so you um, you had to use shared bathrooms. Um, and it's still, I think, price. Yeah, still you're looking at about two and a half thousand dollars per room night. And they were even charging that when they didn't ha have en suites. Um, you can't swim in the area because of crocodiles, but they do have a little freshwater pool. pool. And as I mentioned, you've got this kind of strong Aboriginal element you've got wildlife that you might not see in other places and there's a lot of um a lot of fishing so this is for your sort of quite adventurous kind of people or families that um you know really just want to have um an experience that not many people get to to experience in australia then on a bit more of a, a luxury level you've got the berkeley river lodge um again only accessible by air it's um up on the north East after doing never eat soggy wheaties, um, northeast kind of um, end of the Kimberley. Um, so it's a 20 room lodge. You've got all these kind of individual villas if you can see them vaguely there. Again, that's you're looking at about over um, 2,800 per room night. Um, and they have scheduled activities as well. So whether it's river cruises, um, four by four excursions, um, going out fishing. Um, going to see the, the rock art. Um, not a lot of internet, I believe, in the villas unless something has changed. But, um, you know, you could just sit in your villa and, and have a nice glass of wine and, and uh, look out at the view. So these are some of the activities that you can do. You can see the villa here. It's, um, you know, a lot more luxurious than at the um, Kimberley Coastal Camp. Um, it, there's all quite private. And you've got this gorge behind you where you can go up in swimming holes. And they've got a they've got a um a swimming pool as well. And then El Cuestro Homestead. So you would have heard of El Cuestro. Um, it's one of the luxury lodges of Australia. Um, it's all inclusive. The service there is, you know, it cannot be faulted. When I went there, you know, within 20 minutes they knew my name, they knew what I liked to, to drink. Um, your activities are all included. Um, so that could be going um, going out on a gorge cruise, um, going and swimming in some water holes, going on hikes, um, you know, looking at the history of the area. So El Cuestro is a, um, a cattle station of 800,000 acres. So it's a huge, huge property. Um, lots and lots of opportunities to do anything. Um, the, the El Cuestro property itself actually has sort of three different ranges of accommodation so the El Cuestro homestead being the most exclusive um, and you've only got I think it's about 18 guests that can go there but then you've got other layers um, such as El Cuestro station which um, offer they do have some cabins there and then you've got some camping as well so there is a variety depending on your clients 
budget. Um, with our Questro homestead obviously being the most high end. And um, in terms of, you know, sort of a look and feel of it, you've got these beautiful um, cliff top huts there. To, well, they're not really a hut, <laughs> they're, they're beautiful. Um, so um, there's a few different room types there. Uh, this would be my pick, one of the cliff top huts, because um, it's quite private. Um, and you've got these ama amazing views. You can see here, it's beautiful and comfortable. Um, and they can do some private dining experiences, say with the Boabs. You can take helicopters and go and have sundowners on the top of a cliff. Um, and you know, they, you can do a sing along around the campfire. The food there is really de delicious. Um, when I was there, it was um, communal dining. So it you creates a wind tunnel. <laughs> so, sorry. <laughs> um, can you please mute yourself? <laughs> um, so, um, yeah, so beautiful. You can organise some private dining there if you if you want as well. But we um, we ate uh, communal style, and that was fun getting to know the other guests. And you've got these beautiful swim holes there. This is called Emma Gorge, and uh, this is called Zebedee Springs. So as I mentioned, it's a really big property with the different layers of accommodation for the El Questro homestead guests. They get private use of these um, these locations for a select number of hours every day and then the rest of the guests are allowed to come in from the rest of the station so you'll get the campers and the people staying at the other styles of accommodation um, but for a few hours you'll get to have um, that all to yourself and then another accommodation um, this is in the um, this is actually in the northern territory part of the Kimberley so over on the east um, is Bullo River Station so um, this is again it's a, it's a cattle station um, been around for for absolutely decades, um, it's about 500,000 acres. Um, it recently changed hands, um, the ownership. And so what they've done is um, they've recently just refurbished the insides of the, um, the guest accommodation, uh, done by this lady called Sabella Court. And she's done just, a, it's very, very cool um, the way she's designed it. Um, very, very pretty and quirky and interesting. Um, so you've got these um, 10, 10 or 12 guest rooms there. They typically, um, they weren't, they don't typically fill them. So you'd probably only have two different lots of guests at a time, whether that's, you know, a family, one family and then another family or, you know, two lots of couples. They, at this stage, don't seem to be um, too greedy and with wanting to have every single room filled. So quite often you'll just, it'll just be your, your guests. Um, and really there, it's all about just having access of the entire 500,000 acre cattle station to go and do whatever you please. So the guides will sort of talk to you and say, you know, what, what are you interested in? Is it Aboriginal art? Is it, you know, wildlife birding? Um, the Australian Wildlife Conservancy is now there, so you can go and see the conservation aspect of what they're doing as well. Um, if your clients are interested in the cattle side of things, they can go and, you know, watch whatever cattle active cattle station activities are happening at the time. So when I went there, um, we saw them spading the female cows, which I didn't like at all, but um, the guys I went with found it fascinating and stood right up close. Um, they may be mustering, so your clients might have an opportunity to go and uh, and, and see the mustering in practice. Every guest there, they have a helicopter that um, is permanently, uh, permanently based there now. So every guest um, booking gets a four minute complimentary helicopter ride. So um, if you've got a, a couple, then you've got sort of eight minutes free helicopter ride, which is enough time to take you up to these um, cliff top huts that they've got up there. And you can either have a sundown a drink or there's an opportunity to spend a night there as well. Um, they've got swim holes, there's a beautiful pool there. Um, a lot of the um, history, uh, the Aboriginal history, um, disappeared when um, when the new owners bought the property. Um, there, I think there was a fight or something with the former owners and uh, amongst themselves, not not with the new not with the new owners. And um, so they removed. They they basically just got got rid of all the evidence of um, and and all the knowledge that they had gathered over the years owning the station. So um, 
the new owners are now really trying to rediscover what's on this 500,000 acres of property. So, you know, there must be lots and lots of um, Aboriginal art there that um, is unknown to the current owners and they need to go looking for it and rediscover it. Um, but there are certain spots that I got taken to where you see this, you know, ama amazing Aboriginal artwork. But it's really a, just a, a big playground waiting for, um, waiting for your clients. It's um, a lot more casual than, say, El Questro, so it doesn't have that kind of um, high-end five-star uh, five dining kind of feel to it. It's more, you know, that working cattle station, but um, really, really fun, and I, I absolutely loved it. To get there, um, you go from Kununurra, and you, yes, you can self-drive, but really the way to arrive is um, by small plane. Um, primarily because their driveway in itself is 75 kilometres long. <laughs> so um, better off just arriving um, rock star landing right outside the homestead on their own private airstrip and then your guests can just really enjoy it um, while they're there. When I, um, when I stayed there, it rained the night before um, we were due to leave and our, um, our pilot on the way back to pick us up got a bit nervous and didn't want to land the plane because it had been raining and she was worried that, um, you know, the plane would get stuck and um, have an accident. So um, they ended up sending a long range helicopter to pick us up. And I have to say that was actually the best thing that happened because getting picked up by a helicopter and taken uh, for 45 minutes back to Kananara over all the Kimberley escarpment and, and seeing the water holes from up the top was like, really, really magical experience. And then um, back, to the, back to the coastline, just finishing up on, um, on doing expedition cruising in the Kimberley. So you do have, um, so you've got about three luxury vessels, which I'll touch on, um, sort of with shared experiences. Um, you, that we would typically recommend, you can, um, there are a few kind of bigger ships that also go that have um, sort of, you know, 120 passengers plus. Um, the ships I'm talking about all have less than um, 40 passengers. The true, and, and the reason you probably want a smaller ship in this area, and again, it's a bit like going to Antarctica, you know, you, you don't want to be waiting for people to come on and off um, I don't know if the boats, you don't want to be sharing that experience with, you know, 100 people. You want to be sharing it with just a few people. Um, so, I mean, tr the True North, it's a luxury lodge of Australia, even though it's, um, even though it's a vessel. Um, this is the one we would most recommend. Um, and they've got a range of different cruises, depending on the time of year. Um, but you're looking at about $20,000 per person for a, a, a 10 night um, cruise. Um, the, the, the true north itself, the vessel, what makes it so good for this region is it's got a very um, shallow draft, so it can go right up to the waterfall. So your guests can be on the bow of the boat and the waterfall can be coming over them. And so I think that's quite an experience. It has its own helicopter that travels with the boat. Um, the true north is all inclusive, including your, including all your um, your um, Alcohol, although sorry, including some alcohol, and then additional you um, you pay for it. Um, but yeah, one of one of the premium kind of bucket list experiences for a lot of people in Australia. You've also got um, these other two small ships. Um, again, you know, none of these none of these experiences are cheap. Um, these ones, the helicopter. Um, it doesn't stay with the boat, so you'll turn up at certain areas and a helicopter will arrive and then your guests can go and do an experience, you know, flying to the top of a waterfall or whatnot. Um, these ones, they organise, in terms of the alcohol, you sort of do a, um, a delivery style service, so you order it and it will get um, delivered to one of their ports and then um, put away for your for your guests onto the ship, but it's sort of... It's their way of getting around some kind of alcohol policy. Um, so just back to kind of all the, the trips. So the um, you've got different waterfalls at different areas um, and the some of the waterfalls are um, what we call spring-fed and some are 
sort of river fed from the kind of from the wet season. So depending on what your clients are really trying to get out of their Kimberley cruise would depend when you um, when you tell them to go. So if they're really wanting lots and lots of waterfalls, I would say, you know, go early on in the season, say around April, May, because that's when the waterfalls will be coming at their highest, especially those ones that um, are fed from the annual rain cycle that comes. Um, the Generally the northern waterfalls are um, sort of the rain fed ones and the southern fed ones um, are sort of available all year round because they're, they're spring fed. So that's just something to keep in mind um, for your clients if, if they're really fixated on waterfalls. But you know, any time you know between sort of May and September, they're going to have the most amazing experience going all around these islands and then going up the little channels, um, going on land, having picnics and walks, and drinking great wine, and um, yeah, truly a very nice experience. And then we can also, if your clients have the budget, we can also organise um, private charters as well. So. Um, you know, we we organised this for a client um, with a helicopter following it all along the way, but um, that's not a cheap option. I think that came for about half a million dollars for a week. So, um, <laughs> got that budget great. Um, but you know, um, and that's really about it. So, um, I've tried to cover as much as I can, but obviously, you know, there's probably a load that I haven't told you. Um, but yeah, if you'd like to ask any questions or um, send me an email, that's about it. So thank you for your time. Thanks, Nicola. Thank that was you. Great. That was really, really good. Appreciate it. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. That was wonderful. That was awesome. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nicola. I can see questions. Oh, thank you. Bye.